Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kieran Agarwal Harding, and I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the director of the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. I'll be giving you a brief introduction today on uh, biostatistics. This is by no means a comprehensive review. Uh, biostats is a huge field, but I do hope that it'll give you some familiarity with the terminology and start you on your journey to analyzing data effectively. I have no conflicts of interest. And today I'll attempt to answer the question, what is biostatistics? Uh, we will go over basic terms, describe statistical inference, the different types of variables we deal with, the principles of hypothesis testing, and some basic statistical tests. So let's dive in. What is biostatistics? Of course, biostatistics is the application of statistics in medical research, in all kinds of studies. Statistics is the science of, of learning from data and of measuring, controlling, and communicating uncertainty. It is the art of conducting a study, analyzing the data, and deriving useful conclusions about real-life problems. So the key steps of statistical analysis are, first, to state a valid research question. Then we collect information or data for answering this question. We validate, clean, and organize the data, and then conduct what's called exploratory data analysis to understand the data, to characterize it. Then we perform our formal analysis of the data. We translate the numerical results into answers to our questions, we interpret the results and derive conclusions, and then present the results effectively and uh, communicate effectively with people. To begin, let's go over the basic terms in, in statistical analysis. So first of all, there's data, all the information we gather to analyze, uh, to answer a specific research question. Then variables, each study, the study population characteristics, treatments, outcomes, demographics, things like that. Then we have our subjects, each person included in the study, observations, which are the data elements, population, which are all the subjects of interest, of which we are analyzing a sample, which is a subset of the population for which data are collected. Now, this, uh, this hopefully makes things clearer. Uh, let's take a simple dummy data set, a group of 15 students and their performance on some test. All these numbers, uh, are the data. We obviously have 15 subjects here, and for each subject, we have data for seven variables, age, gender, etc. Now, for each subject, for each variable, we have a single data element, um, which, uh, which is our observation, and all our observations make up the data set. Now, say we have a question like, what is the average age of a patient undergoing hemiarthroplasty in Ethiopia? Our population, in that case, would be every single patient in Ethiopia who had a hemi, right? But it's impossible to, or, or perhaps impractical, to analyze all those patients. So we analyze a subset, a sample. And this is what statistical inference is all about. We use data from subjects in our sample to make inferences about the population at large. So, for example, we use the sample mean to estimate the population mean. But that requires that the sample must be representative and the sample must be sufficiently large. And from the sample, we measure different kinds of variables. There are discrete and continuous variables. Discrete variables are further divided into nominal and ordinal. So a nominal variable can be either binary, like gender in the case of our dummy data set, um, or nominal variables can be categorical, like occupation, for example. The variable has, been, has named categories but doesn't have an inherent order. Now, discrete variables can also be ordinal, where there is an order implied, like grades in our dummy data set. Obviously, an A is better than a B, better than a C, and so forth. And then we have the continuous variables, which are measured on a scale. They include things like age, height, weight, exam score in our dummy data set, but there are many others, obviously. And so for these variables, we use descriptive statistics to help us summarize and understand them. So for discrete variables, we typically use frequency, where we count the number of subjects in each category, and relative frequency, where we calculate the proportion of subjects in each category. So for our dummy data set, let's look at the two discrete variables, gender and grade. We can summarize these with our frequency and percentages like this. And this is typically what I do in my table one uh, for, for a manuscript. This gives you a general sense of the distribution of these variables, uh, which can be very helpful, uh, both for the reader and for yourself when performing analysis. 
Uh, and you can even chart these uh, to further understand the distribution. So as you can see here, we've charted the, uh, the grades. Now for continuous variables, uh, we use different statistics, uh, different descriptive statistics. Uh, we have measures of both location and dispersion. So measures of location indicate where uh, the collected values of variable are located within a range of possibilities. Um, and then measures of dispersion include um, are, are measures of how dispersed the collective values are, i.e. like basically what is the spread across the range. So, you know, for measures of location, we have things like mean, median, and mode. Measures of dispersion, we have range, variance, standard deviation, interquartile range. So let's start with mean. So mean is your average value. You basically, as many of you already know, uh, you sum up the values and divide by the total number. And so in this case, our mean age uh, was uh, 23.9. Now for dispersion, when we're looking at mean, the dispersion variable we typically look at is variance or standard deviation. Um, and we use this to understand the spread of each subject's value away from that mean value. So for each subject, we use the difference from the mean, the, their particular age, minus the mean age. We take the square of that, and then we sum those for all the patients, all the subjects, and divide by the total number of subjects divided by one. Now that gives us our variance, and then we take the square root of our variance to give our standard deviation. So here's a histogram plotting all of our subjects by their age, and we see the top right corner, the mean is 23.9 plus minus the standard deviation of 4.5. This is how I report all my means and tables and manuscripts. Um, and uh, basically what this means is that 68% of the data will lie within this range described by the mean plus minus the standard deviation. Now, if you look at the spread of the data in the histogram, you'll see that the mean falls roughly in the middle, as you would expect. But maybe it's being pulled a little bit by these two older individuals over here in their 30s. We usually assume that uh, large enough data will follow a normal distribution. Uh, this is the normal distribution bell curve, which many of you may already be familiar with. Uh, but sometimes data can be skewed one way or another. And a quick way to tell this is by plotting the data in a histogram and comparing your mean, median, and mode, because the, the tails will pull the mean away from the median and away from the mode. So let's talk about median. Median is another measure of location. It's the middle value, right in the middle of your data set. So 50% of data will be above it, 50% will be below. You put the data in order and take the value right in the middle. And in this case, it's 24, which is actually quite close to our mean of 23.9. Now we describe the dispersion around our median with the interquartile range. So the first quartile is at the 25% mark. Our median or the second quartile is at the 50% mark. And our third quartile is at the 75% mark. So in this case, our interquartile range between Q1 and Q3 represent 50% of our data, and it's between 20 and 26. So 50% of our patients, of our subjects, fall between the ages of 20 and 26. It's a way of summarizing the data. Now, here's a nice way to depict uh, the same data. So this is a box and whiskers plot. The box represents the interquartile range here with a line in the middle representing the median. And then this X is the mean, and it shows you sort of the difference between the mean and your median. And then these whiskers on either side represent your range. You can see here that our data is perhaps a little bit skewed by the older students, but our mean and median are basically the same. So it's not so bad. So what about outliers? So we typically define outliers as observation above Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range or below Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. These are called outliers in the box plot. And those would be beyond those whiskers, individual dots that would be, on, be beyond those whiskers. Outliers are simply part of the data. They are not caused by typos or errors and you can't ignore them. Outliers explain how many extreme values are located at the tails of a distribution. And they certainly do, do, they certainly require a little bit of attention. Uh, now, the last descriptive stats that we'll mention are mode, minimum, and max. So the minimum and the maximum are self-explanatory. They're just the minimum and maximum values of your data set. But the mode is the most frequent of the values. So in this case, we see that the most frequent value was 22. And our age range was 18 to 33. 
So here's our summary for the dummy data set that we were analyzing of all the continuous variables. We have here our mean with our standard deviation. We have our medians with our interquartile range, and we have our modes with the ranges. Now, I will say that I very rarely use mode unless there's a particular variable that calls for it, but I very frequently you will use mean and median to summarize my data, and this is exactly how I would present it in a table. And here is what all that data looks like when it's plotted in histograms, which also helps you sort of understand the overlook of uh, the overlay of this, uh, um, sorry, the layout of this data um, to characterize and understand it. So you can see here, for example, that our ages are sort of clustered more in the young 20s with a few outliers here. And our mean, as we know, came to about 24. Height is pretty evenly distributed. Exam scores are as well. Our weight, we sort of have, um, you know, a large number of patients here who are uh, weighing very little, but then most of our patients are sort of above, you know, 70 in this, uh, in this uh, kilo group. And here again is our data um, plotted in box and whiskers plots. And again, you can see here, for example, for weight, that we're being, our, our median is being pulled a little bit away from our, uh, our mean, which is being a little bit pulled towards those, uh, that group of patients who are in the lower weight range. And so this just helps us understand the population a little bit to characterize it. It's useful for us as um, uh, as analysts who are going to go through the data and draw conclusions. And it's also useful for your reader who will want to understand the data set so that they can understand whether the patient population you studied is generalizable and applicable to the patient population that they are treating. So now that we've understood our data, we can move on to statistical inference. So using our sample to estimate the values of parameters for the population and then testing specific hypotheses. Now, the confidence interval is a, is a very helpful tool. So suppose X is a variable uh, like systolic blood pressure for a population of size N with an average uh, blood pressure of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Now, we select a random sample of patient one, patient two, all the way up to patient number n of a size n, a point estimate of mu is the mean of x. And then the standard deviation of x is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And so the, the standard, the 95% confidence interval is then this um, x bar, which is the mean of the population x, plus and minus, uh, plus, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Now you can understand uh, from this formula that as our sample size n gets larger, the confidence interval tightens. And this is really important and we'll get into this later. So here's an example of how we calculated the confidence interval. In this case, we are 95% confident that the mean for the population is within the range of 135.91 and 136.73. So I, I typically use confidence intervals in many of the papers that I write. Very useful tool. So let's move on to hypothesis testing. So suppose we want to study a characteristic in the population with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. What is the value of mu? It is an impractical or perhaps impossible task to measure an entire population. So we select a random sample from that population and infer the value of mu. We can also compare the means or proportion between the two samples to see if there's a difference. Now we typically have what's called a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis or HO um, is an explicit statement about an unknown parameter, the validity of which we wish, wish to answer. So typically we say mu, as in the mu that we are estimating for the population based on our sample is equal to mu naught or the, the sample, the, the, the entire population's mu um, uh, that, that's the null hypothesis. It's the same. Our sample is the same as the population. The alternative hypothesis states that's the opposite. The sample population, uh, the sample, uh, uh, the sample mean is not equal to that of the population. We can also, we can do this two-sided saying that that's simply not equivalent, or we can do one-sided saying that it's greater than or, e or less than, um, the, the mean of the population. But when we test these hypotheses, hypotheses, we can make errors. Anytime we run statistics, there's always a risk of error. Say that the null hypothesis is in reality true, right? So there is no difference between our sample and the population. But from our statistics, we conclude that the null hypothesis is false. We detect a difference between our sample, our sample uh, subjects and our population. 
that's called a type one error. And say the null hypothesis is in fact false. There's a difference between our sample and the population, but we incorrectly say that it's true. There's no difference. We think there's no difference. That's what's called a type two error. And we want to limit the chance of this happening. So in summary, a type one error, basically you set your probability as alpha, right? Alpha is our standard. We usually set it as 0 0.05. This is why you have p-values of 0 0.05 as the standard. We're willing to accept a 5% risk that we are wrong when we reject the null hypothesis. Now let's talk about type two. So we, we signified the probability of a type two error as uh, beta. Uh, this is related to the power of the statistical test. Power is basically one minus beta. Um, and we can decrease the risk of committing a type two error by ensuring that there's um, uh, that your test has enough power. So enough sample size. And we'll get into this a little bit more. Um, Here's a way to explain these two concepts. So uh, imagine we have a population with a mean of some value mu, and this is our target, this is our population, and we're trying to shoot to get the, the mean for the population and hit our target, okay? We run an experiment with a sample of the population, and we're aiming for the target, and our sample ends up giving us a mean here. This is the mean of our, of our sample, um, and we call this x bar, and we want to say that x bar is equal to the mean of the population mu. Can we say that? Well, it depends on the accuracy of our test and if our sample is representative. Well, say we run 10 experiments, and if our population is representative, then our null hypothesis is true, right? The mean of our samples should be the same as the mean of our population, and we should be close to our target. Then mu we are estimating is the same as mu naught. And if we run infinite experiments to estimate mu, each result will fall in this distribution, right? And if mu, uh, and these are the probabilities of getting a particular estimate of mu, and if mu is equal to mu naught, then the cluster in a normal distribution around mu naught. So they should cluster around the actual true mean of the population. So any individual test that we run and sample that we get and estimate of mu that we get gets plotted here. And of course, like if we have a good test, the vast majority of our tests should be clustered around mu naught and demonstrating similarity between mu and mu naught. But here's one experiment that we ran just by random uh, that actually gave an estimate from mu that was quite a bit farther away from what our actual true value of mu naught is. Um, and so that falls into this range here. And occasionally we get it wrong. And by chance, our sample estimate is so far away that we commit what's called this type one error. We reject the null hypothesis and think that our sample is different from the, the mean of the population when in fact it's just normal and it's just it, it is the same, but it's just the the scatter of um, statistical error that's causing that difference. So we usually set this threshold as a uh, five percent five percent risk of committing this kind of error. Now, similarly, imagine that the null hypothesis is actually false and our sample is not representative. In fact, we don't want to hit our target. Our sample is different from our target. We're aiming off of our target. And so when we shoot multiple times, we get a cluster that is a little bit away from our target, and it forms a bell curve just like we saw if it was centered on the target. Now, occasionally, we will accidentally hit the target, even though we're aiming away from our target. And so we will commit what's called a type 2 error, where we think our sample is the same as our population, when in reality it's different, and we just by chance were hitting uh, the target of our population, thinking that the two were the same. So these concepts are linked. Uh, we can increase alpha to reduce beta, but it's a trade-off. There's an overlap between our um, uh, null hypothesis being accepted and rejected bell curves. And so we refer to one minus beta as the power of a study. Basically, it's the area under the curve of this, um, you know, rejecting the null hypothesis curve distribution of, of uh, responses. And uh, the probability that we can detect a difference between our sample and the population when there actually is one. So power is a function of sample size. And I hope that this uh, this is coming through here with the animation. Um, and what you'll see here is that uh, as we do more tests, throw more darts at the board, our estimates cluster more tightly around the mean. And this makes it easier to tell the difference between samples that are the same or different from the population. And our beta gets smaller, our power gets bigger. So you can see here, as the population, as the sample size gets bigger and bigger, our 
samples cluster more and more and more around their means. And so beta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and our power as a result increases. So this is why power is related to our sample size. And conversely, now, as you see, as the sample size gets smaller, our distributions expand more and more. There's more overlap between these two bell curves, and our beta gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, also, power is a function of effect size. If you uh, um, say the mean of our sample is very different from the mean of our population, it doesn't matter so much how inaccurate our dart throwing is, right? If we aim far enough away from the bullseye, the chance of accidentally hitting the bullseye is lower. So here you can see, you know, our cluster is away from the mean, but because the difference between our sample and our mean is not very high, we end up accidentally hitting our, our, our uh, population uh, mean every once in a while, our bullseye. Now, if our, we aim further and further away from the target, these become more and more different. And so our power increases. You can see that from this graph here. So I hope that was clear. Uh, these are the two, these are some of the basic statistical tests that we use, and I'll go over this very superficially. There's a lot more to learn here. Um, so there's also a difference between testing a parametric variable, in other words, a variable that is normally distributed, as we discussed earlier, compared to a non-parametric variable that's not normally distributed. I won't be able to get into all of this today, but suffice to say, no, we assume that large enough samples can be treated as if they're normal distributions. So here's our dummy data set again. Let's assume our population is normally distributed, even though that's probably not a fair assumption in this case. Um, we want to compare, for the purpose of our analysis, age, height, and weight between the men and the women. We want to know, is there a difference in exam performance between men and women? And we want to know what factors may have influenced exam performance. So uh, we can separate men and women and calculate their means with 95% confidence inter intervals. And then we can perform t-tests to see if there is a difference between the means. And this, is, this can be done with very basic statistical packages. This can be done on Excel. And you can see that the height and weights are statistically significant, um, are, are statistically significantly different uh, between men and women. Uh, in fact, you can see that the 95% confidence inter intervals don't overlap at all. And that's a nice quick gut check to make sure that your p-values make sense. Now, chi-square tests are useful when seeing if there are associations with categorical variables. So say we want to know if gender is associated with getting less than 80 points on the test, right? So first, we count the number of men and women in that category. Uh, that's the observed. Then we add them up and divide by the total number. So that's um, 8 divided by 15 gives us about 53%. So 0.533 is the proportion. That's the overall proportion that scored less than 80 on the test. Now, if we expect men and women to be the same, then both groups would have had the same proportion. So we multiply this 0 0.533 by the total number in each group. And that gives us what we call the expected number of people, of subjects who would have scores less than 80. And in this case, we would expect 5.33 men and 2.667 women. Uh, now, using this formula, uh, we calculate the chi-squared statistic for each group and then add them together. So we take the observed number, four in this case for men, minus 5.33, we square it, and then we divide by 5.33. In that case, the chi-squared statistic is 0 0.33. We do the same thing for women, that's 0 0.66. We add it together, the chi-squared statistic overall is one. And using statistical calculators, we can convert the chi-squared statistic into a p-value. In this case, the p is 0 0.317, not significant. So in this case, we're seeing that there's no significant association between gender and performing, uh, getting less than 80 on the score for your test. Another test we'll go over is ANOVA. This is also called, this is uh, the abbreviation for analysis of variance. This is where we're comparing the mean of three or more groups. We're trying to understand, is there variability between the groups? Uh, is it by random or is it due to the grouping that we have chosen? Is it inherent to the variable that we are examining? So in the case of our dummy data set, again, uh, we can say, um, you know, does exam performance differ by weight? So we take the weights, we group them by groups of 10, 55 to 65, 65, 75, 75 to 85. And we take the means and the standard deviations of the scores for the folks in all these different um, weight categories. And we can see here, if we just look at means, it looks like the lighter students uh, performed worse than the heavier students, right? But is that, very, is that variability actually because of the weight? Let's see. We put it into ANOVA. Statistical packages are very good at doing this. We can plug it in. 
the ANOVA test, and it plugs out an F statistic of 2.0587, which converts to a p-value of 0.17, not significant. So the difference in the means, the, the variance in the means that we're seeing across these categories is not associated with this category. So we say that weight is not associated with performance on the test, as perhaps we would have predicted. So the last test I'll touch on briefly, which is quite complicated, is regression. So if many of you may remember from grade school, a line has the formula y equals mx plus b, right? The slope is m. Um, and it helps us determine how much y changes every time x changes. So if for every one increase in x, y increases by m. So similarly, we can plot two variables and create a line of best fit that minimizes the difference between each point estimate and the estimate created by the linear model. That's the graph that you see here on the right side. Now, we can become more complex by making this multivariate. So this is a two-dimensional model with just two variables. This is a bivariate analysis. We can do multivariate analysis, which is multidimensional with many different independent, independent variable Xs that all play a role in determining the outcome Y. Uh, we can also define Y not as a continuous variable, but as a dichotomous variable. And that's what's called logistic regression. So where each independent variable X plays a role in determining whether Y is zero or one, rather than on a continuum, continuous scale as a continuous variable. So in the case of our dummy variable, this is just for the purposes of demonstration, uh, let's look again at weight and grade. So we ran a linear regression and we find a very, very weak uh, correlation. R squared here is, uh, is very low and it's a measure of goodness of fit, zero being no fit, one being perfect fit. And this model suggests that for every one kilo, exam scores increase by 0 0.67 points. But be careful with this kind of correlation here because you can see that it's very weak. And in fact, we've already tested in prior statistical tests that it's not significant. It's mostly just for by chance. So in conclusion, we've gone over a lot today, uh, but when we do statistical analysis, we first start by stating a valid research question. This is being covered in the other lectures today. We collect information or data for answering the question. We validate, clean, and organize the data and then we perform exploratory data analysis. This is what we talked about, understanding the data, calculating the mean, median, mode, the, the, the standard deviation, uh, interquartile ranges, plotting the data in histograms to understand how it's distributed. Then we analyze the data. We use our statistical tests. We use statistical inference to understand whether, uh, um, you know, what, what our sample can tell us about the population we're wishing to study. Then we translate the numerical results into answers to our questions. We interpret the results and derive conclusions, then present the results and communicate with people. So thank you so much. Uh, if you scan this little QR code, you should be able to get my contact information. And here is my email address. Thank you for your attention.